dinosaurs and man. Two species separated by 65 million years of evolution have just been suddenly thrown back into the mix together. How can we possibly have the slightest idea of what to expect? Hello, and welcome back to the Neo Jurassic Podcast. I'm your host, Bry, and I'm very, very pleased to have you tune in for this ninth episode of the show. And I hope you've enjoyed the show so far. I mean, seriously, uh, I, I really, really hope that you do. In particular, I hope you all have enjoyed the trilogy of paleo artist profiles that uh, we had a couple weeks back. It's an aspect of the show, paleo art, that I love exploring and plan on doing in much greater detail in the future on the Neo Jurassic YouTube channel. YouTube is obviously a much more suitable medium for discussing visual art and and I have some exciting YouTube projects developing for those of y'all that are interested in that paleo art conversation or the show for that matter. If you're interested in both, definitely do it. In the meantime, if you find yourself hungering for more podcast paleo art prattle, I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend checking out the Love in the Time of Chasmosaurus podcast. For those unaware, the podcast is the latest extension of the paleo art blog by the same name from fantastic paleo artist and designer David Orr. The show, I want to say is monthly, goes much deeper into the finer details and highlights truly top tier artists and scientists alike. It's truly a fantastic show, and if you are interested in paleo art and you do enjoy it, I, I couldn't recommend it more, so absolutely seek it out. And, you know, I had so much fun producing and sharing those paleo art episodes that I, I decided to have a swing and experiment with a new sort of thing, I, something a little different for this episode. Our guest this week is self-described paleontologist turned futurist turned podcast host Michael Garfield from New Mexico. Kinda like a 21st century Dr. Ian Malcolm, Michael works for the Santa Fe Institute and broadcasts a wild fractal spiral of a podcast named Future Fossils out into the world every two weeks. The show explores the countless connections in an ever-expanding universe of ever more complex systems from a distinctly philosophical and psychedelic perspective. For five years now, Future Fossils has been getting real weird and diving real deep with a fascinating and incredibly diverse selection of philosophers, scientists, authors, artists, and many, many others. It's a truly fascinating show. And to date, the Future Fossils episode examining the Exotica movement with musicologist Phil Ford remains one of my favorite episodes of any podcast. So shortly after I launched the Neo Jurassic podcast, Michael reached out eager to have an opportunity to process his thoughts on the past, present, and future of the Jurassic franchise. And naturally, I was all too happy to oblige. The resulting conversation between the two of us was a lot of fun. Unfortunately, I really had to hack this episode down quite a bit, but there will be an extended version available on the Neo Jurassic Patreon, and maybe even the Neo Jurassic YouTube, we'll see. We're gonna go ahead and start off our conversation with Michael discussing the intimate beginnings of his relationship with Jurassic and the many ways the franchise has shaped him and his worldview over the years. What is your history with Jurassic? How did it begin? How did it start? Sure. Yeah. I met Robert Bacher at the age of three. Yeah. I was uh, seven when my mom and I went up to Boulder, Colorado and called him up on a lark. And he agreed to meet me for lunch and ended up like kicking it with me for two hours over tacos and just answering all of my questions and showing me he had the world's oldest brontosaur skeleton in the bed of his Datsun at in the parking lot. And like, I still have the photo somewhere uh, of that. I can try and find it and send you. And this at, at age seven, um, I guess at that time, I had already read the hardcover first edition of Jurassic Park because I was asking him questions about whether he thought Dilophosaurus actually had a venom delivery system and like that kind of thing. 
And yeah. so I was already obsessed with the the story at seven. I don't know that I really, I think most of that book went over my head at the time, but mm-hmm. it was just the absolute coolest thing I'd, I'd ever read. And weirdly, uh, my father at the time worked for Universal Studios and we were, you know, he, he was one of the folks that helped open Universal Studios Florida in 1989. And so... I spent most of my grade school years thrumming with excitement, knowing that the film Jurassic Park was under production and then getting to see it at, uh, at age nine, I was actually lucky enough to attend the world premiere in Orlando. Wow. Cause we only lived a few miles away from the park. Uh, yeah. So. Oh, wait in Florida. Yeah. Oh, I I'm from central Florida. Also. Oh, really? Where? uh valrico okay yeah we uh, I, we never made it out it's, there it's but... a, yeah you know where it is it's like it's a like brandon tampa yeah 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 adjacent kind of area yeah so yeah we lived in kind of yeah we lived kind of right between universal studios and disney which was so, okay. a, a, a very odd childhood in retrospect um but so yeah so i saw i got to see the world premiere uh my one of my best friends as a child his dad also worked for Universal Studios, and you know I remember collecting the the Topps Jurassic Park trading cards, and you know reading the the comic books and writing letters to the editor of the Jurassic Park comics and seeing them published and getting to like pick those up at the yeah. local comic book store and being just like having my mind blown that you know I had hit the big time. I had a letter published in the in the back of Jurassic Park comics. Uh, was it like one of like the raptor attack comics? Yeah, 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 like, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was. Yeah, and in yeah. fact, I I don't know what happened to my stash of Jurassic Park comics, but I should probably pay up and find some on eBay or something. Literally two days ago, I just started buying those Did series on, on Amazon and eBay, like two days ago. Yeah, I had two letters to the editor that were published, I think. And I think one yeah. of them was in Raptor Attack. Uh yeah. So yeah. So I mean, I still have. Oh, it's in the living room, but I still have the original uh, Kenner 1993 Tyrannosaurus from the you know that you squeeze it and it roars and you stomp its the big red one, stomp its feet, the yeah, red and yeah. black one. Yeah. Yeah. And that lives. That that's. Uh, that was actually. It was beautiful to see my my infant daughter last year, like go from being terrified of that toy to learning to like to becoming affectionate with it like hugging it you know and i was like oh she's Uh learning to be brave thank you jurassic park um yeah you know yeah so i i was i was a rampant collector of all the toys and then by by age 12 bob had you know invited me out to to the the dig sites so i was working out there from the ages of i think 12 to 20 every summer and I, by the, by the mid nineties, when they had built, they were building the ride out in Hollywood. And mm-hmm. my dad at the time had already moved on to a, a different position at Walt Disney, but I, he knew enough people. Walt Disney Imagineering or just Walt Disney? No, Walt, Walt Disney period. World. But he, okay. uh, but I did actually see Robert Bacher give a talk in Orlando at Walt Disney Imagineering. Uh, at oh, some wow. point, like he came in and give gave a presentation, and I think you know, in retrospect, his fluency with being able to speak and draw on a big piece of butcher yeah. paper at the same time to like illustrate yeah. his ideas on the fly and just like improvise his way through yeah. a, an academic lecture was an of enormous influence to me as both an artist and a, and a public speaker, and uh, oh, really? so yeah, so that that was all going on. And, uh, so my dad knew enough people still at universal studios that he was able to secure me a hard hat tour of the ride while it was under construction. I never actually rode the, the Jurassic park ride because I was terrified of plummeting faster than gravity. Yeah. You know, (laughs) down this thing. Like I was not, I was not a fan of roller coasters. This was the Hollywood one or the, yeah, it was a Hollywood one, one. the Hollywood one, but I never went on either of them uh, because I'm, I'm not like a roller coaster guy. I actually get like, 
I like kind of like a break into a cold sweat watching these computer model uh, fly throughs yeah. of the the, the uh-huh. new Velocicoaster in, yeah, in Orlando. Yeah. I'm like, oh my god, how can yeah. anyone survive? <laughs> like, <laughs> this is not just like. Oh, I can't. Here. I cannot <laughs> wait for it to be on that thing. I cannot <laughs> wait. <laughs> no, I'm very much in that in that sort of like I I deeply identify with Alan Grant like just tying the two ends of the seat, the two female yeah. ends of the seatbelt together yeah, yeah, on the helicopter yeah. being like, there were years as an adult um, where I, I had a, a, a terrible fear of flying and, and really had to like do some work to, to get through turbulence and that kind of thing. But at any rate, so yeah, so, I mean, it was, I, I had a strangely intimate relationship with that franchise from the very beginning. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I remember, having the uh like the the making of jurassic park coffee table book as a kid and just pouring over that hour after hour yeah and yeah mine mine is like has got so much like cereal milk all over it over like the years (laughs) of just like flipping over while i'm having breakfast every day from the age of like eight to 22 or whatever oh yeah so Yeah. yeah so you know and i was i was one of these annoying brats that was just constantly picking at the scientific inaccuracies of everything and was really mm-hmm. angry at the representation of Tim Murphy in the film as this like doofus yeah. kid. You know, I yeah. was like, how dare they? Cause I was like the same yeah. age, you know, when the film came yeah. in, I was like, that is not fair. Like that, that <laughs> they're, they're exploiting, you know, like it's like seeing somebody like misspell words on purpose on a kid's menu yeah. be like, Oh, I'm uh-huh. a kid. And it's like, that is not yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. It's like they really, yeah. they really ought to have given children the same respect as the book did, as both books yeah. did. And I think, you know, I, I yeah. never got to meet Michael Crichton and I really wish that I had had that opportunity. But I really had I had I had the chance to meet him, I really would have thanked him for portraying children in those books as smart and capable. Totally. Yeah. yeah. So that's. Yeah, that's sort of the backstory, I think. Do you prefer uh, Jurassic Park or a Lost World novel? Boy, you know, I've been thinking about going back to them this year with the Future Fossils Book Club and revisiting them. It's been a long time. I mean, I I hold them in sort of equal regard. You know, Lost World is a sequel, and as such, it doesn't stand on its own. You know, like it... Jurassic Park is a prerequisite for appreciating that book in its entirety, as is Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's The Lost World, upon which yeah. it's, you know, it's basically just a, right. like a, re, a re, kind of a reboot within his own yeah. franchise. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, I think if the digital archaeologists in a thousand years only found The Lost World, it would make no sense you know, yeah. but if they only found Jurassic Park, I'm still holding out that one day we'll have the opportunity to reboot that film. And I know that yeah. this is sacrilege to a lot of Jurassic Park fans, but no, I don't. I mean, yeah, I'm sure everything. Right. Is. I mean, you, you can can't please everybody. Point anything, it'll be sacrilege. But yeah, I would yeah. really, really love to see a faithful adaptation of that book that really, you know, that was like an R-rated film that. Yeah you know, killed Henry Wu and like dealt with the, I mean, it would have to be a television series. Like it would have to be like a long form sort of thing like that to really get into the nitty gritty. Yeah. And you know, just to, you know, to that point, I just want to give a shout, uh, a moment of celebration and praise to Westworld, which, you know, is I think in some ways exactly what I was hoping that we would get out of Jurassic park. Uh, you yeah. know that it's like I mean you know there's there's issues with it but like overall I think it's addressing the ideas that Michael Crichton is bringing up in his work in a way that completely surpasses any of the actual more like closely hewn adaptations of his stuff um, yeah yeah and you know again that's thanks to the form the long exactly. form of television is such a much more valuable storytelling medium than films ever were in my opinion yeah I, at least as far as like science fiction is concerned and like getting into deeper concepts and things and character for that matter. i mean maybe we could pull it off in like a Zack snyder four-hour justice league type no. cut maybe nah. Nah. maybe 
No, I mean, that's just such a, such an unwieldy, uncomfortable experience, I find. You know, like a four-hour movie, you know? it's. Eh. But yeah, like, I really want to see Ed Regis getting chewed on by the, the juvenile Tyrannosaurus, you know? Yeah. I want to see... Yeah the Costa Rican military come in at the end of the story and firebomb the island. You know, I yeah. want to see the raptors preparing to migrate in their secret underground yeah. nest. All of the, mm -hmm. the most profound and like chilling and awesome parts of that book were, ex were eradicated. Like they were all pulled yeah. out. So I don't, and, and the same is actually true for the lost world. You know, I from even more so. Oh, for yeah. Me. The Lost World has so much like animal behavior and speculative stuff in there that uh, makes my head go on fire. I really love totally. It. And it's weird how like you see this is not just this is not unique to the Jurassic Park franchise, but like I was so excited about the Carnotaurus. Uh, in, uh, we all were. We all and it's were. Like, Michael. And then we get like, what do we get? It's like uh, what they did with Alien versus Predator. Right. Where it's yeah. like. Okay, they took some of the ideas out of that, yeah. but then they just like kind of like slapped them into this completely different story in a in, an almost unrecognizable it, way. I I feel like we've all been waiting for that, and it like it was just such an incredible idea and scene. And I mean, granted, it didn't really pay off in any major plot way. Like it, it was yeah. just kind of like this moment that happened that was cool. But it, it's so frustrating that they never like. Every, like from the age of whatever that book came out, like I was just on the internet waiting to find out when that scene was going to be translated to the screen. Like that was like my whole focus. Like, all right, when's the Carnotaurus scene happening? When's that going to happen? When's it going to happen? Never. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and now did we talk about it? No, we did talk about this on Twitter about now we know that the Carnotaurus was much more like less of like a sedentary ambush predator and more of like a quick footed cheetah type thing. So like really wouldn't make too much mm -hmm. sense to have that type of highly cryptic, uh, chromatophore situation going on, but I I really hope we get to see that. Makes more sense than the Indominus Rex. Like I might as well just go on record as saying that, you know, I I I, wa I liked watching Jurassic World the second time better than the first time because the first time I was not prepared for this cheeky like almost Joss Whedon style, uh, you know, self referential meta commentary on how the film that you're watching is actually like a yeah. massive corporate monster created by the runaway economic process yeah. that created the first film you know yeah. and and like now i actually kind of have this appreciation for that although it's strange you know when you when you look at the way that the franchise is communicated and the way that it's handled in public that's never really explicitly addressed by anyone. Like it's, 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 it's like no one, uh, no one on the Jurassic world production team is actually talking about the fact that that film was a critique of itself. But like, to be fair, I think that that was a, that was a process that started with David Cap in the lost world. Yeah. You know, that, you know, for David Cap to write in the, you know, the whole scene where the kids, looking out the window and there's the t-rex out the window and then like he he wrote himself into the film where he gets eaten by the t-rex in san diego in the blockbuster it actually it's actually even earlier than this because steven spielberg has said that jurassic park is in some way his reaction to jaws in that he created this f movie monster like the blockbuster he created the blockbuster yeah. and now it's rampant and running all over the place so it started with jurassic park so that is in the dna but you're, he's able to do two things like he did both things with that you know and he's like a superior filmmaker in every way even lost world did that better jurassic world i think just fails on both accounts for me yeah i mean t you know just t you know to be to be fair i think it's it's interesting to you know to watch the way that like you you said earlier you know uh, when you have like Michael Turchik walking off the pre-production set or the, you know, the, the post-productions, wait, wait, it would have been pre-production set of, of Jurassic Park because Steven Spielberg kept modifying his scientifically accurate sculptures of Tyrannosaurus. And he's like, you don't yeah. actually care about this stuff. Like you're trying to give the T-Rex yeah. a gorilla nose and like all of this. Yeah. And so he bails and then, you know, these, 
uh, there's a there's a really fabulous essay by uh, W J T Mitchell called The Work of Art in the Age of Biocybernetic Reproduction, where he's talking mm. about Jurassic Park and the shift in emphasis from the plotting Tyrannosaurus, the, you know, this giant super predator kind of Godzilla thing into mm -hmm. the Velociraptor and how that's the, sh that's the shift that's being made here in an, an age where we're moving out of, you know, the, the first and second industrial revolution into the third and fourth of information technology and biotechnology. Yeah. Yeah. And that, you know, what we're really, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a fascinating piece. I can't do justice in the time that we have, but like, so we start the, we start the franchise with Raptors as, as these like monstrous villains. And, mm -hmm. you know, I thought that again, to, you know, to your question about Jurassic Park or Lost World, the way that Crichton himself treated this in the Lost World, I think was completely beautiful, you know? Exactly. That's one thing that is a huge part of my interest in this project, my whole interest in animal cognition and all of this stuff is there. That, that, that's a huge part of the whole thing. Yeah. And, and in a way the lost world book was more honest to this, the thesis that it was making than Jurassic park, because Jurassic park talks about chaos theory, but it's this completely well-oiled machine of a techno thriller that carries you very predictably from point A to point B in that, you know, the whole thing's going to fall apart. And mm -hmm. whereas the nonlinearity of complex systems, the unpredictability of them is on display much more effectively in the lost world where, like you said, the end of the book, there's just like this weird non sequitur Carnotaurus scene. <laughs> and like, there, yeah, you yeah. don't feel a, you know, the same kind of pinch of, of escalating action that you do in that yeah. book uh, as you do in the first one. And that's true to the way the world really is, you know, that totally. it's like, it just kind of peters out at the end. I don't know. Just yeah. Kind of, it's like, Oh, done. now we're yeah. all on a boat and God knows what's going yeah. on. It's like, that's that, that really nailed it. Yeah. When I heard that they were making a film called Jurassic world, I thought, Oh my God, here we go. This is the, this is the film I've been waiting for, which is the film that addresses the reality that has, you know, how our world has shifted since the first movie and book were made, which is that now yeah. we live in a world where we are, where GMO food is not just like a science fiction. It's yeah. probably most of what you're eating where like yeah. we, we, you know, we cannot contain the pathogens that we study. We are constantly <laughs> kind of trespassing on wild systems with our, our wild meat trade and our, our development. Mm -hmm. And we are on schedule to have a new global pandemic, like every four years because of the pace of at which we're eradicating wild ecosystems and releasing these pathogens out of their, their native environment and into the global economy. And so we have to reckon with the genie that we cannot put back into the bottle in a way that, you know, our world is the, the, is, Jurassic World. And I was really hoping that the first Jurassic World was going to be a film in which we have pet dinosaurs and we have, you know, dinosaur yeah. steaks at the restaurant and we have dinosaurs, you know, breaking out of the zoos and running down the street. And we, you know, and like people are riding them to work and like, like that. I, I love, um, I love Jurassic Park conspiracy theories. And I love that there's like one that obviously holds no merit. But I love that, that some of the folks are talking about Jurassic World Dominion being a prequel to Dinotopia. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that it's like, that is yeah. what it is. It's like, we need to find a, that balance, right? And I, it's like, well, they, 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 they built more longevity into the franchise by starting where they did. Because that's clearly where they're going after this. So, like, it makes sense to start off with this other thing and then make your way there. You can get more... Right, right. Juice Squeeze it for all it's that worth, way, right? You know? That's what we do. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> but like to to that point though, to the point of of Jurassic World not being a film about the contingencies of the unmeasurable, 
you know, not being a film about the butterfly effect and about, right, about yeah. you know, the iterating fractal of runaway complexity, but being a film about, yeah. like, we just had a really powerfully, obviously dumb idea and went with it because it was going to make us money. Um, and then for in the wake of that film, for all of these people to say, no, 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 watch it again. This is industrial sabotage. Like, this is this is employees of the park trying to steal intellectual property because they no longer feel like they don't feel like they're, you know, they're, they're being sort of like held in check by InGen yeah. and Masrani corporation in a way that they're yeah. like, well, we could be doing so much more with this biotechnology. I deserve to be getting paid better. We could be using these things for warfare. Yeah. And so it becomes clear. I think that, it's even though it's never explicitly brought up the way that Nedry and his thing is brought up yeah. that what we're dealing with here is, is uh, it looks like a conspiracy to undermine the park and to steal the dinosaurs out of it, you know, because I think that that thread speaks to specifically how the world has changed. Uh, there's two, two pieces. One is we've humanized the, or like we've, we've, we've made animals out of the monsters through our familiarity yeah. with them in the same way that like gestalt psychotherapy allows you to take the monster haunting your dreams and establish a kind of like friendship with it. Um, yeah. That these are no longer dragons on the edge of the map. They're pets and yeah. they're, they're, they're the wolves that have repopulated an, an anthropocenic Yellowstone, you know, yeah. like th there is no such thing as wilderness anymore. Uh, except yeah. now everything is wilderness. And so that's yeah. part of it. But then the other part is, again, to that point about my, you know, the, the talk I gave at Moogfest about techno shamanism and, and the, the, the breakdown of the boundaries between, you know, like literally the city walls that the Greeks and the, the you know, like these other ancient cultures were erecting against a wilderness that they feared, you know, a wilderness yeah. in which dryads and, and satyrs and gods yeah. lived out there and it's not safe out there. Uh, and that those walls have come down. And so now we're in a place where it is natural to return to our original human disposition of a kind of cosmic paranoia. And that mm -hmm. it's that we are looking to attribute agency to the mysteries that we are stuck fit, like negotiating. And so yeah. that, that looks like conspiracy theory. And if you look at like, you know, the way that the American political landscape in particular has been shaped by people who cannot, like we cannot handle the, or even really perceive the enormous complexity of everything that's going on. Not even the people in power can. And yeah. yet we have this built in cognitive bias that wants to uh, minimize the amount of personal responsibility for making decisions and and creating maps of this world. And so we look, you know, like when people get terrified about the pace of technological change or cultural change, they look for a scapegoat or they look for a charismatic strongman leader who can guide them, who can make things simple again, who can make America mm. great again. And so like in a weird way, the, the you know, like... <sighs> As much as I'm glad to see that, to, to hear that <laughs> development, it's exactly yeah, yeah. what I'm pointing to, which is that we're we're trying to restore the like the the simplicity of a narr like a a, a predictable yeah. narrative plot yeah. to yeah. Yeah. this world that has completely run out of control. Totally. And so, like, it, it, okay, we mm -hmm. can talk about dinosaurs escaping the park and like integrating with the rest of human civilization, but only yeah. by saying oh it was secretly biosyn the whole time it's like the illuminati yeah. of jurassic world yeah. right yeah, like yeah, it's yeah. like this is bonkers yeah. like this is not that's a very good point that is very very good point it, it it really does resonate with our current place actually a lot yeah like biosyn is like the QAnon of jurassic, of jurassic. yeah yeah <laughs> it's like what yeah i mean it's like the mother of all q and like the mother of all conspiracies you know everything is is all explained through this one nonsensical um uh conspiracy theory right and so um, like in a so, way in, in, a, in a way that's just yeah like that wraps uh 
in a way that completely undermines everything that Ian Malcolm ever said yeah. in the series, which yeah. is like that you can't control this. You know, <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, well, I mean, I mean, to be fair, like all of those efforts went awry. You know what I mean? Like all of these attempts did not pan out as anyone expected. So that that much is consistent, you know, so like, <laughs> sure, they, th there is evidence of this conspiracy, but they're not really faring any better, like any attempts on their own to manage the situation has also failed consistently. So yes and no, like I, I can see an argument going both ways. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, just relatedly, I'm really hoping, uh, I also was a huge fan of the H.R. Giger's Alien as a kid and like the alien, the alien movies. Oh, I mean, I, I continue to be a huge fan of, of those. Yeah. And I'm really, really glad as, as bizarre and surreal as it is to hear that Disney has purchased, you know, 20th century studios and is now in yeah. control of alien movies. Um, I'm yeah. really glad. Which they've wanted for a long so time. so strange though. It, I'm really glad. Yeah to to hear that they're finally uh going to do a, a, a tv series and alien films that take place on earth you know yeah. because it, it really it's time as a as a species i think for us to like it's clear that the, the this topic coming up in films like it coming home yeah it like coming off the island and into your house yeah is like yeah. exactly what's going on. Like you used to go to the movie theater and now the movie theater comes to you, Here. you know? Yeah, and it's like yeah, yeah. now the dream world is like fed in into you rather than you yeah. having to go on a pilgrimage to it. And so like yeah. for the alien films to be about like aliens in a city rather than on yeah. a spaceship, I think that's, that's a really key marker of what kind like, of the process of, meaning making and uh, you know of like digesting the the situation in which we find ourselves and you can see that change and yeah so i'm really you know. I, I i i yeah i get the res like the resident import importance of that but i also don't know if i how they're gonna make that work in a way like i it's easy i mean for, I'm, i mean i think about jurassic park day in and day out so i can imagine all the ways that that's compelling to me in that context but with Alien, I'm really curious about how they're going to make that work. And if they ever do, like, I'm curious if they actually get there. Well, you know, in the Alien comic books, the Dark Horse comics, they made it a situation in which religious cults developed around the alien. And and, oh. and the alien uh, queen's royal jelly was a uh, turned out to be a powerfully psychoactive performance enhancing oh. drug that created okay. this whole economy that, like, destroyed human civilization became because everyone became addicts and uh and like cult members and so it was okay. that the when aliens hit the earth a large part of it was more about the psychological and social impacts of it than it was about the like oh chestbursters are everywhere kind of thing you know see that is fascinating to me that that is really intriguing to me actually and you can see that like the the seed of that in alien 3 also like that that's that 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 that, that that's where that began that's interesting totally. how did you feel about the uh prequels prometheus and covenant respectively i liked them i mean yeah. i i say i think you know to the point that we're we're making about non-linearity and challenging people's expectations about the plot you know, I think, yeah. you know, Ridley Scott is what you would call a tenured professor of film at this yeah. point. He does whatever yeah. that he damn yeah. well pleases. And he, what he likes to do is challenge people's expectations. I mean, without spoiling yeah. anything, I think a lot of people were super pissed off about the the uh, last episode of the first, like the season finale of the first season of Raised by Wolves. Raised by for Wolves. For that reason, yeah. you know, because it just completely corkscrewed it into a new dimension. And you're like, what the hell? Yeah. And I think that Prometheus did that for people, too. They went in expecting an alien yeah. film that was going to obey yeah. a certain formula. And he gave them something a lot yeah. more like the novel, The Lost World. Yeah. Where it was just like, yeah. people are just in this mystery. And like every question yeah. that you answer just opens 10 more questions. And then you're left at the end being like, what the hell yeah. did I just watch? Yeah. And I love that stuff because I think that that. Yeah, me too. You know, one of my favorite authors, Richard Doyle, he's an English professor at Penn State University. He wrote a book called Darwin's Pharmacy, Sex mm -hmm. Plants and the Evolution of the Noosphere, about the evolution of language as the product of a psychoactive symbiosis between humans and and psychedelic plants 
and that huh. and you know what he says is that the the distortions of the subjectivity of the modern world the the idea that i'm over here and you're over there that the modern world depends on is profoundly fatally challenged by the psychedelic experience in a way that is useful as preparation for the convoluted systems level kind of construction of identity that we're going to require under the conditions of our trans of like transhumanity or post humanity uh -huh. that like yeah. basically psychedelics are training wheels for a a human being that understands itself as an emergent phenomenon at the intersection of all of these these environmental agencies and uh, yeah. you know so like i i consider films like prometheus and novels like the lost world to basically be psychedelic drugs in the sense yeah. that like you you know it's like you are you're going to have your expectations challenged and they're innately mind expanding and draw you into a much deeper mystery in the case of lost world it's it's about you know the contours of complex systems in the case of prometheus it's about this sort of ancient aliens like human origin thing about like yeah. our, our our participation in a vast and ineffable cosmic ecosystem like russian dolls of gods exactly creation. and so like that is that is what we need that's the that's yeah. the new axis mundi yeah. for postmodernity yeah. you know is totally. is not we're there's a pyramid a great chain of being and we're on top of it it's like yeah, yeah. there is this like you said a nested doll and we don't know yeah. which layer of that doll we're in and it's, totally. it's probably turtles all the way down right yeah so it's like who <laughs> yeah. knows uh so yeah. yeah i loved it so I feel like we touched on your relationship to the Jurassic franchise. We didn't really talk about where you are with it like today. We talked about Jurassic World. We didn't really go into Fallen Kingdom. Um, what? How? How did you feel about Fallen Kingdom? That's a very divisive, similarly to like uh, uh, Prometheus and Alien Covenant. It's like a very divisive movie. I'm gonna I'm gonna defer to my my little brother on this one, who is a my my brother Will Van Zandt is a, a amateur film scholar and i think he offers uh -huh. really excellent review of this kind of thing and you know he pointed out that it really felt like they tried to staple three different movies together Absolutely, you know yeah. and and you know yeah. to be fair i you know i've always spoken on or in the defense of films like the the matrix reloaded because uh -huh. it's like well you've got a trilogy you've got one film the first film of the trilogy has to stand on its own and the last one has to bring everything to completion. But right. the second one is a bridge that just has to get yeah. you from point A to point B. And so yeah. it's, you can't come in with the same kind of expectations of films like that. Right. Like Empire Strikes Back is a complete fluke. Like somehow that film yeah. is the best film in the original Star Wars trilogy. Yeah. And it's yeah. not just like, okay, we have to hit these plot points to get to the third film. Yeah. But Dr yeah. Fallen Kingdom absolutely is that. And I, you know, I don't, what I don't appreciate about that film, which it sounds like I may, a problem I may have with Dominion as well, is the retconning. You know, like I don't appreciate the, <laughs> the inclusion of like a secret business partner that's like uh -huh. been there the whole time and was like, you know, the yeah. one that was, and like, there's a lot of weird, uh, I mean, it'll be interesting to see what, if anything they do with the issue of human cloning in dominion. Yeah. Cause it's like, if that was just a sort of throwaway non sequitur yeah. thing, you know, it doesn't yeah. seem like it's being, it doesn't seem like, it seems like an opportunity to bring all of these points home in a way that ha like has something more relevant to say about real world biotechnologies and the kind mm -hmm. of questions and problems we're going to have to be, you know, we're going to be confronting. We are confronting about this stuff, but a lot of that stuff was just sort of like, there wasn't enough 
quality control in the writing meetings or something like that no. people were just kind of yeah. like okay we can just take whatever ideas from whatever other franchises we want and just like throw them yeah. into jurassic world and so you yeah. know there were there were some cool points you know i really loved i loved the uh finding the old footage of of young blue and like the sweet the oh, sweet little moments shit. like because yeah. we were talking about that like the way that you've got to you've got to yeah develop an emotional relationship with this creature that used to be a monster you know and so like getting developing blue as a character i really appreciated that i really uh you know i i I appreciated the they really had some some beautiful shots in that film for sure there's no question oh yeah like they had beautiful but but then when you think about it it's like you know like the South Park member berries, like so uh-huh. much of that film was actually just drawing on nostalgia and fan service. Jurassic, uh, Jurassic World as well. Yeah. Like that, that's just something that I, I, I cannot abide in these movies. Yeah. It's, it's but of course, I mean, that is, that is core to the process of the accelerationism that we're stuck yeah. in, which is that, yeah. that, uh, you know, a, 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 an economy built on capital flow has a way of eating its own tail and so like it's it it's optimizing for the values that the value that it understands how to capture and so it's constantly capturing you know like the psychedelic counterculture was appropriated by capitalism almost immediately you know and and likewise you know the as any system scales it becomes you know it bloats on the gains of efficiency that you get with scale you know but it it bloats in a way that makes it less resilient and less innovative in certain respects and so you see this with like the collapse of industry i mean uh international supply chains during the disruption of of covid19 where it's like our entire manufacturing and shipping systems were built on these like just in time extremely brittle fragile things because those were cheap and that's like we yeah. were able to like duplicate things, you know, and you end up yeah. losing the redundancies that allow for adaptability in a system. And so what this looks like in Hollywood is that you end up like Hollywood has been completely devoured by these enormous film franchises that are just constantly regurgitating themselves, like eating yeah. themselves and spitting themselves back out in new forms. And so like that system has uh you know, the, the real innovation has moved to places like Netflix where yeah. people are being given, it's like an island ecosystem versus the continental mainland where like mm-hmm. you can't, you know, evolutionary innovations just get lost in the noise on the mainland. You know, you can like, yeah. if you really want to have a popular band, you need to go to like Australia yeah. or the UK or somewhere where yeah. it's like the, the, the network is small enough that you can actually innovate and then be heard, you know? Yeah. And so I, I, yeah, again, like Netflix is willing to, to take a chance on something and like throw massive amounts at stuff and waste it. And yeah. like, and so all sorts of amazing stuff has come out of that. Uh, yeah. And yet, you know, I really, yeah, it's the not, I mean, I say this with all the love in my heart, but like, I do, I do worry that, that Jurassic park has, sort of become its own worst enemy in this respect. And that, it, that, you know, the more, like the deeper that we go with it, the, the less it has to teach us, the less it has to say, because it's just, yeah. or the same was true with Star Wars. You know, the, the, the sequel trilogy to Star Wars was, or at least, you know, like the, well, the force awakens. It's telling. Yeah. I mean, and then they, they took chances with the last Jedi and we all know how that, played out you know like violent 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 reaction (laughs) so i mean it's 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 a tricky system that we found ourselves in yeah very unfortunate yeah yeah you know people get mad when your your big mac has like turkey on it or whatever you know it's like don't (laughs) please don't come up with your own ideas thanks yeah Yeah. i just want a damn big mac thanks so well okay so Related to this conversation, what would you like to see from the future of the Jurassic franchise? 
I mean, there was a lot of really interesting stuff that was explored in the comic books that followed mm-hmm. up to the, you know, the the first film that I think it would be hard to, you'd have to kind of like reboot things in order to bring, like wind the clock back in order yeah. to explore those in the same way. But, you know, I, I generally speaking, you know, I, I mean, I should say that like, I really did think the notion of a secret continental facility where dinosaurs were being bred on the mainland was you know that's like an interesting piece and and really you yeah. know that that's something that i felt was really important in the lost world you know this notion that the entire like hammond being there for the birth of every dinosaur was yeah propaganda you know yeah. and that really i mean this this speaks to the relationship between the state and the deep state and yeah. you know the you know corporate marketing and advertising and like the way that our like industrial systems actually operate you know like yeah. to actually see the sausage get made uh mm-hmm. you know to visit a a factory farm you know compared to like mcdonald's yeah i'm yeah. loving it yeah you know mm-hmm. it's like mm-mm. Mm-hmm. uh so you know i think i'm i would like to see more more exploration in, in in those terms but then but then also yeah i don't know i mean i i would i would i would just like to see i mean how many ways can you really tell this story of the thing breaks out well that's a thing for me and my interest in a neo-jurassic world is that i i find man's relationship with the natural world today fascinating particularly at this point when we're meddling now in 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 crispr conservation and all these other methods of of pushing life forward i i think there's so many ways to explore our relationship with animals in the natural world today via the jurassic park franchise because it offers this heightened uh, sort of science fiction way to access all these different ideas. And and that's, that's what I would like to see from the future is like exploring all these aspects of our, and, and that's kind of what the franchise is doing at this point. Again, it's moved away from the evils of, of, of uh, genetic engineering to an extent. And is kind of more looking at like, you know, uh, the reality of, of how we engage with animals and conservation and, and, and all of that. Yeah, I mean, if if it gets to the point, as it seems like it it will and must, where you know the the Jerry Hardings of this franchise are not, uh, you know, corporate employees but national park rangers, you yeah, know, yeah. that's that's interesting. You know, if it gets to the point yeah. where the Muldoons of this franchise are leading people on safaris through transformed ecosystems. At this point, I should really give a shout out to Ethan Pettis, the author of the Primitive War novel series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh Because I feel like, in a way, he's giving us what that could be. You know, that that his, his novels about the, like a time gate that opens up during the Vietnam war and dinosaurs spill out of it and bring with them Mesozoic diseases. And like, yeah, they've, you know, he's got all of these stories that, that capture vignettes of how dinosaurs reenter all of the, you know, like human history in a way that, yeah. that he's been playing with in very interesting ways in up to and including the, you know, the notion that like snow owl looking Utah Raptors, end up in the Himalayas and functioning like vultures in sky burial rituals, you know, and that like that it is, you know, you, there's a lot of creative play in, you know, how do we, how do we replace the, the interoperability, the functionality? uh, How do we, how do we basically, okay. So let me, let me put it like this. Um, Almost every mammal alive lives in a niche that was created by dinosaurs or like, yeah. or, or even earlier 
life forms mm-hmm. or like other archosaurs, you know, dolphins, mm-hmm. ichthyosaurs, you know, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, the, you like, uh, you know, anteaters and like, there is yeah. anosaur- like this kind of stuff, sl- yeah. giant sloths and there is anosaurs maybe yeah. or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. And so like, it's actually fairly straightforward to just roll the clock back on all of this stuff and say, okay, well, uh-huh. I mean, basically and do what James Gurney did in Dinotopia kind of, yeah. And say, okay, so if we're gonna if we're gonna add all of this stuff to human society, then we already have a map for where all of these creatures would would end up finding their niche in the modern world. Yeah, and so you get to play with that in in a really fun way. And uh, you know, I have heard that uh, Quetzalcoatl is in the new film. I don't know if that's true or not, but. I would love to see a uh, Skybax rider. Where did you hear that? So what? Where did you hear that? Where did you hear that? Rumor. Just complete. Okay. I, like back channel. I don't, I don't think it is. Unfortunately, well, that, that is my number one dream. Oh, yeah. like, I, well, now that the Carnotaurus thing is like off the map. Yeah. Quetzalcoatl as, as dark as are my favorite, uh, ancient critter by far. Um, I don't think it is. Uh, well, here's to hoping. I, and then here's to hoping yeah. that, that well did you see the pitch trailer uh no i don't think i did okay okay um my my first episode of the podcast was all about as dark kids and the pitch trailer for jurassic world which was setting up um a much more basically the next stage of what this jurassic franchise is going to be so you can see that where they're doing uh I'll, I'll send it to yeah, you after, please do. after this thing. Um, uh, uh, sorry, continue. What were you saying? Oh, just, the, <laughs> just that, like, I mean, were that rumor true, Yeah, I want somebody riding that thing with a saddle. Yeah, you know, because okay. cause to me, like, you know, just as a, I'm sure there's lots of folks in your, your mm-hmm. audience that were also obnoxiously into dino riders as children. Uh-huh. And that's a film that I've wanted to see adapted to a live action series yeah. for as, basically yeah. since the age of five, you know, and yeah. we're finally at the point over the last few years where we could pull it off. And yeah. that's, you know, I think in a way that's where I think Dino writers does a better job even than Dinotopia of sort of portraying the two options that we have as civilization of finding a harmony with the wildness in us and the wildness around us versus trying to control it and trying to dominate that world. Yeah. And so you, you know, you've got, you know, uh, cybernetically mind controlled dinosaurs being used as weapons versus like the peaceful agrarian, like high technological kind of, new age protagonists that have established these like respectful telepathic connections with Uh and it's like that's yeah that's really that's the fork that we're at as a species and obviously we're going to go both ways because that's what evolution does is it explores all possible outcomes from where you're standing now and so uh you know to, to give a nod to Stuart kaufman at the santa fe institute whom many claim was a, a an inspiration for the character ian malcolm that uh Stu talks about this term the adjacent possible and that evolution is constantly expanding the coastline of what is which of course expands mm. our access to the adjacent possible and it's this runaway chain reaction and so that's what i would like to see with the future of this franchise is just to see more commentary on the technological ethics and the the question of parenting these these yeah. technologies and bringing the you know like bringing the next world into our world in a responsible yeah. way and then how that clashes and it looks like that's what they're doing you know that's yeah. that's certainly like our protagonists versus the military industrial dino appropriation complex that we have in fallen yeah. kingdom yeah um but of course in saving the dinosaurs they also like decide not to let them get gassed 
and like release them into yeah. the woods. <laughs> and so you, I mean, that's actually, that actually opens up. And I hope that they treat this in dominion that opens up a really kind of nuanced question about do gooder conservationist thinking, you know, where it's yeah. like, well, that was present in the lost world too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, certainly, certainly trying to save the baby yeah. T-Rex and like what a nightmare that. Well, yeah, and this, this sabotaging the whole camp and, you know, and then that ends up like causing this chain reaction of like, you know, very bad things. Right. So, yeah, uh, eco-fascists. But what we don't see, what we, we haven't seen yet is that from the other side, you know, we're like the people are trying to do the the bad thing and it ends up backfiring unpredictably and leading to unanticipated good, you know, yeah, and that would yeah, be yeah. really interesting is like, yeah. uh, you know, if, if we can tie, if you're, if it, this biosyn conspiracy thing is accurate and we tie it all back into the first film in a way that makes it look like Dennis Nedry was accidentally a good guy, you know, yeah. that he was sort of like the Anakin Skywalker type deal where it's like whoops yeah, you brought yeah. balance to the force you know yeah <laughs> like, yeah yeah kind of a jerk yeah. but you you know yeah that's i mean that's what i want is and then that's, that's what i yeah. think movie going audiences are a lot more prepared for than they were in 1993 is this kind of like moral nuance and and uh like breaking bad slash the good place I, sophistication yeah the gray area uh, the, i think television is the only place we're going to get that level of sophistication because it's very clear at this point that movies are just getting like kind of like dumber and dumber and more bombastic in my experience dumber and dumberer even yeah, yeah. i mean i mean in fallen kingdom we had people like surviving pyroclastic flows and you know sticky molochs breaking through brick walls and you know it's, it's just it's 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 jumped the shark in a lot of ways for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was like I was really glad to see the stigmolic though, you know. That was cool. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I am curious I so I again, I grew up in Central Florida and I am uh I grew up in theme parks specifically. And so uh, they're enormously important to me. Um what is your relationship cuz I've never experienced any of the meow wolf miracles. But you are in New Mexico, and when I saw your totaled car, I was delighted to see the li- custom license plate Jurassic and then Meow Wolf right under it. And I'm like, oh, yeah. oh hell yeah. <laughs> um, so what is your relationship with Meow, Meow Wolf, uh, particularly, you know, having a parent that was involved with, you know, Universal Studios as it was being conceived? Like, I'm curious what, is, what that is for you. Meow Wolf, I think, is the Velociraptor to the T-Rex of Universal Studios and Walt Disney World. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, to to draw on the WJT yeah. Mitchell thing that like that in the the you know the sunset stage of late capitalism yeah. and the you know the way that like one size fits all manufacturing has now become design your own Nike shoes. Yeah, you know we're realizing thanks to the sciences of chaos and complexity that uh, bespoke solutions are more appropriate for site specific installations if you will Mm -hmm. and so there's there's two things worth i think pointing out about meow wolf one being that uh former ceo vince kudlubeck went on to he's still involved but he also went on to start up Mm -hmm. another company called spatial activations that's all about pop-up attractions you know and i think that's a very natural I mean, that's that that's in the DNA of Meow Wolf that like before the House mm-hmm. of Eternal Return was built, it was all just these like little pop up shows, you know, that yeah. this this thing existed for like maybe a month or two at most. And yeah, so there's an there's a, a quality of ephemerality in the world and and less less about institution building. You don't download music yeah. anymore. You don't buy it. You stream yeah. it and then you just sort of like release it back to the celestial jukebox ocean you know and so that that's really interesting to me because i think that you know especially post covid when it looks like people are going to have a hard time congregating at scale in the way that we did that the 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 attraction economy is going to move into something that emphasizes smaller 
installations, smaller parks, smaller yeah. gatherings in the same way that like you dump a whole bunch of water on the ground and then it percolates into the soil. And like, mm-hmm. you know, that there's like a, like a river, do- like we're looking at fractals, right? We're, we're watching mm-hmm. this system uh, go through a, a system level shock in the same way that like, you know, comet hits the, the Yucatan and everything over five kilos is wiped out and mammals survive, yeah. you know, that like yeah. the small and the nimble are, at a great benefit in in Mm -hmm. the collapse of these legacy economy you know like enormous scale systems yeah it was funny though because my i took my dad to meow wolf uh last time he visited santa fe and he was like what is this like he didn't get it like it didn't make sense to him because disney like we were talking about with jurassic park and and lost world and prometheus and alien and all that disney takes you from point a to point b they set you up with exposition while you're waiting in line. You're on a story. The story has a clear beginning, middle, and end. You know, and Universal is like that too. Like you get on the thing, and then the final boss is like you go through the legs of the T Rex down the waterfall. You know, and that's that's a structure that is tried and true. You know, the narrative structure is the way that we encode information effect efficiently in the brain. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's not uh, honest to the nonlinear world that we live in. And so for Meow Wolf to be this sort of choose your own adventure thing where the story Uh is not forced down your throat, but is a mystery that you explore and discover on your own as you navigate this environment kind of by your own volition. He didn't get it. Like he was like, what, what, how can this succeed? And it took their enormous success to convince him that there was something here. Uh, yeah. And, you know, the, the other, the other thing I'll say about Meow Wolf that I really appreciate that I think links into Jurassic Park is that, and I'm not spoiling anything because there are televisions with animations throughout the house of eternal return that tell you this story. It's like the most narrative that they offer is that uh-huh. this building is this, the product of a sort of a dimensional rupture between different worlds and uh that it's it's offering a kind of a cosmology or a metaphysics that is uh isomorphic to jurassic park that is about you know these sort of celestial beings that manage to act like create and then contain this profoundly potent creative entity this force of creation Mm -hmm. And then that creation leads to this rupture and this escape and then the the uh, the breaking of boundaries between silos. So like again, like Meow Wolf is telling a story that looks a lot like Jurassic Park. It also looks a lot like the the Super Mario Brothers and Sonic the Hedgehog <laughs> movies, where like they're yeah. taking the fiction and then they're like sp- spitting the fiction out of the fictional world and into like the street Uh level, like into Brooklyn. And then also uh, it speaks to the, the resurgence of uh, generalist thinking and interdisciplinarity in the academic realms that like, you know, the silos are busted. Everything is so connected that everything is like, you know, like Twitter is like technological telepathy and it ain't great. Like, you know, you got to really choose your boundaries yeah. to navigate that space uh-huh. without losing your damn mind. Um, so the question of, that it seems like all of these projects are exploring is how do we stare straight into the face of God, basically? Like, how do we deal with the the creative plenum of reality in a way that allows us to engage with the truth of its pluralism without disintegrating entirely without losing the the narrative structure what what douglas rushcock calls narrative collapse as a product of of the internet you know that like you look at that uh sitcoms you know like television he says you know you see this in tv like it moved out of uh you know this adherence to strict narrative formula and into uh-huh. like reality TV shows where it's like, yeah, yeah, but you know, anything could happen. Yeah. yeah, yeah but, the, but yeah. it's still also subtly, uh, it's still following 
that formula there's the, yeah the design yeah. yeah and so so yeah so meow wolf i think is really interesting because I, I mean i see in their intentional work uh you know in the narratives that they're they're shaping in this the medium of the spaces that they're creating and in the effect that it's had in the world uh as as all being extremely relevant to the issues that y- that you've wanted to talk about on this show uh, yeah and so like i think the natural sort of conclusion of that is as as again richard doyle said you know in terms of like psychedelics being training wheels for transhumanism is so meow wolf is sort of like training wheels for the dinotopia style you know higher <laughs> yeah. level integration yeah. of like yeah. what happens when you can to, you know to not do another michael Crichton novel sphere like what yeah. happens when you can like anything that you think becomes pract- like physical reality you know like when yeah. your dreams come true like and this is what all the te- te- yeah. the technocrats and techno optimists are all like this is great like we're yeah. we're capable of it's like yeah but that also means that you can 3d print a bomb like it it's you yeah. know like we're going to have to reckon yeah. with as again you know as Stuart brand is uh, is fa- famous for saying like uh we have be- like what does he say we we have become gods as gods we might as well get good at it you know and yeah. so like to navigate dreamscapes that have become physical reality like to celebrate that seems necessary but insufficient for the deeper thing that i think the deeper question that is evoked by meow wolf and its success which is what happens when it's not just meow wolf but when all of us have our you know brain reading headsets linked up to 3d printers and like you're on social media so your brain is already open to manipulation and like what you think you know you're the yeah. you're the terminal end of a global mind control apparatus as Jaron Lanier has totally. pointed out yeah. uh so what does that mean in terms of our super powered ability to manifest our thoughts you know like we really like we need to get good at being buddhists like really fast in this space and like not in the in the you know the bumper sticker that says don't believe everything you think you know yeah like it's time for us to really think carefully or bring rather bring much much deeper attention and contemplation to the contents of our thoughts so that we are not just lashing out with our foolish ill-considered desires and creating monsters all the time you know like how do we how do we navigate this in a way that is that leads to nourishing uh that leads to you know equity and and uh fairness and beauty and all of these things because people forget that creativity requires destruction like that you have Mm -hmm. to take something apart to build something else you know and so for for us to just be focused on disruption and on the the rush that we get of our our new god powers is Mm -hmm. to miss the opportunity that we have to care for and in many cases mourn for the world that we must destroy in that act of creation. And so mm-hmm. like, I know that you had, you and I had talked about maybe talking about parenting uh, and what it means mm-hmm. to parent in this world, but like, you know, it's simply thinking about the, like the carbon costs of raising a kid, you know, I think, is sort of adjacent to this line of thinking of of you know what it means to what it means to bring things responsibly into this world knowing that we're just getting you know like we're at the point now where you can think a new song you know like you can just have a headset that like will translate your stuff through a machine learning algorithm into a piece of completed electronic music Uh and it and so it's like well when the barrier to entry is that low you know this is why i think superhero films are so big right now i mean you know uh rice university religious studies professor jeffrey kripal has written a lot about this about 
you know, the, the prominence of superheroes is because all of us are on some level reckoning with the fact that we are so profoundly empowered in ways that like, yeah. you know, people had a problem with Superman, like destroying mm-hmm. large swaths of Metropolis and the man of steel. Right. It's like, no, no, that's that we need to face that. Like we need, to, we, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. it's not enough to be virtuous. There will be collateral yeah. damage. And yeah. you know, how do we, how do we build resilience and adaptability into our systems so that they can absorb those kinds of shocks. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's just, that's the $64 trillion question, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I would imagine for you, the line between what is perceived as being natural and unnatural, like technology being a, a, a unnatural byproduct of like the human mind rather than a, a, like a part, a force of nature upon itself. What is, you, how do you navigate that in terms of this time that we live in, the Anthropocene, like the tremendous amounts of, of alterations that were, were wreaking up, up, upon the planet and these developments proliferating all over the place? Like, how do you navigate those concerns? Um, how, yeah, how do you, how, where, where are you with that? Well, I mean, I try to remember that the Buddha weeps. Uh, I, you know, so like when I had Steve Brusati on Future Fossils episode 70, we talked about why it is that this time in history, the last 20 years, is the golden age of dinosaur science. And it's because yeah. we are in a foot on the gas accelerate over the cliff moment with global development where we're digging up more of the surface of the planet than we ever have. It's that simple, right? So like this, you know, at the same time we, or, you know, or like by the same coin, we have, uh, you know, the, the vast accomplishments that we have made in the last hundred, 200 years are based on, the growth of metropolitan centers, which act as quote unquote social reactors that bring people together and accelerate the pace of innovation. But at the same True, time, yeah. what that really means is like in, you know, that what we are, what most people ignore uh, in that equation is that uh, human and domestic human animal, like domestic animal biomass has now exceeded the biomass of everything else and it like that's insane and so like we're we're at a point where uh we i i mean there is no reason to invoke the supernatural or the unnatural in any of this like the economy is an evolutionary ecology complex systems Mm -hmm. uh, economics has is the the best available tool for understanding the Mm -hmm. flows of value in our world and and like how it is that this is a you know this is not a system seeking equilibrium this is a system that's Mm -mm. constantly uh in this co-evolutionary dance between its components that are sharpening each other that are making this increasing demand on the intelligence of everyone involved like i had a great talk with brian arthur on the other show I run for my day job, uh, Complexity Podcast, Brian Arthur was one of the original complexity economists. Uh, he, you know, he was talking about research that was done in the '90s where they took uh, this evolutionary prisoner's dilemma, this like cl- classic game theoretical thing where like you're arrested, your accomplice is arrested, and you're interrogated in separate rooms, and you're you're given incentives to collaborate with the police or to uh, you know, or collaborate with your your partner with whom you can't communicate or to defect. Mm. And so like what they found was that as they ran this simulation uh, over thousands and thousands of iterations, that the agents got better. Uh, they developed memory. They developed the ability to model and and sort of anticipate the strategy of the other player with whom they could not communicate. And you saw a ratcheting uh-huh. intelligence in even these like extremely simple 1990s strings of code. And so like there is this. Wow. So anyway, so like this is all just this is what it is. And it's a natural thing. Yeah. But it's worth tying that back into like if it's a it's a mistake in some sense to think that 
even though this is unprecedented in Earth history, in at, at in terms of its complexity and its the scale at which this phenomenon is happening, it's also true that we live inside a world, like we live inside this atmosphere that is itself an artifact. It's a technological artifact of photosynthesis, and the mm-hmm. you know the same processes that are trying to optimize the energy capture of of the sun of sunlight and of chemical energy trapped in the the earth's crust and to and optimize it to you know dissipate this this energy uh mm-hmm. that you know in, in the sense that life is just basically physics it's like a runaway physical process right that what we're doing now is really no different from the earliest cyanobacteria flooding the atmosphere with oxygen which at the time was an existential crisis for all of the other anaerobic bacteria. Oxygen was a poison. And we had right. to, we had yeah, to innovate. Yeah. We, being life on Earth, had to come up with yeah. new metabolisms that could use this pollution as food. And so here we are again right. in this situation where we're living so deep in a constructed environment that we that we think of it in these romantic terms as this this I, this Garden of Eden – and the reality was, you know, to to uh, you know to kind of poke at some of the stuff that Crichton brought up in the Lost World in the book, that there never was such a thing, that you know that no. that this is an ongoing, ever changing process, that you know you can't, um, that that you that you know, there's no baseline right, to, exactly. To there's no baseline. To, yeah. So like conservation yeah. biology, for instance should not be yeah. about preserving charismatic species, but it should be about preserving yeah. the biodiversity that allows for thriving ecosystems. And that doesn't necessarily yeah. mean keeping the same animals, like restoring the same animals to an ecosystem that we eradicated a hundred years ago. It might mean putting completely different animals in there that yeah. are able to do the same kind of work. Like if you look at, um, you know, Stuart Brand, wants to he has a a company revive and restore so i i had a two-hour interview with oh, ben yeah. novak uh yeah um that there's going to be the next episode i'm doing after like in two weeks it'll be doing that episode but it was a fascinating conversation and we talked a lot about the same things and it, it, it this is the type of stuff that i'm really interested in so i'm very excited condors <laughs> right? this conversation like, with it's you. like yeah there's i mean it yeah. really is it's so funny how like that that conversation over the Chilean sea bass in, in the film is it really does strike at the heart of, I mean, even though, even though I was so angry as a kid that they, they, the, the gross oversimplifications that they felt they had to make about the nuanced points that Crichton made in the novel in order to bring it to a film audience uh, and the right. way that they portrayed Ian Malcolm and Alan Grant in particular that, you know, they, they use them as the voice box for these like profoundly uh, like out of character assertions, you know, like actually uh, evolutionary biologist, Stephen Jay Gould wrote a great piece on this, an essay on, on this exact thing and on Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and about how both of those films uh, like both of those books in the translation to film took this subtle point about the inability to predict complex systems and therefore our responsibility as creators and then like mangled it into like you should not trespass on god's domain like that there is something that like certain questions should not be answered certain doors should not be open yeah yeah. and that's not what either mary shelley nor michael Crichton were saying they were saying look you can open this door but you may not be ready for it and in like, you really right. need, you know, like you need to be humble enough to care for what you have created or you get into these situations where you, you know, you end up breeding supervillains and monsters, you know? So, yeah, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a fascinating problem, but I ultimately, ultimately, I think that, you know, the, there, there are contrary to popular belief very useful precedents when we think about, you know, the many, many innovations that evolution has made before us and the many, many times 
that this the earth has been transformed by those innovations already you know by like mm-hmm. until a few hundred million years ago there were no there was no mycorrhizal network there was no forest there was no yeah. you know there was there were there were no plants on land you know and and so to talk about like a garden of eden like we have to give credit to this actually in some regards rather antagonistic relationship going on in the symbiosis between plants and fungi uh mm. and between fungi and animals and between animals and plants that you know that you you end up having to kind of square the circle between these retro romantic notions of a of a, a lost paradise and the equally foolish and mis- misled notion that we are creating that paradise through technology you know yeah. like really yeah. we're just taking this the we're, we're, we're participating in the same thing that's been going on from the very beginning right. and like we're just taking it up a notch and the question is totally because of our effect our efficacy at this because of the the power that we have consolidated in the human world at the expense of all of the other agency non-human agency on earth uh are we undermining the earth's ability to continue in this process and i think that's where it really Mm -hmm. that's 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 the the big big question question. is sort of like how long yeah like how deep have we messed this up and how long will it take for us to uh restore the kind of balance that allows things to pick up where they left off you know um just to put one last little thought on that the uh There's a paradigm in cancer biology that what cancer is, is uh, cells that have found a way to hack their their way into additional resources, because these are your own cells, right? Like they know how to mm-hmm. manufacture the chemical signals that, si- that signal to the body, give me more sugar. And yeah. so they grow... Uh, they like basically they found a way to to secure for themselves more resources than all of your other cells, which are playing by the the rules, which are not cheating the system, and therefore they become uncoupled from the collaborative reciprocal kind of social dynamic that binds your body together, and they start acting like they own the place, and they take over. Yeah. And I so in that sense, you know, I, I look at. And, you know, especially, and I know I'm not the first person to say this, there's a great Banksy mural that makes this exact same point, where he says, you know, the the the, the rhetoric of development, or like the think, development thinking is cancer thinking, that like, as soon as we yeah. realized that we could liberate fossils from the ground and use them as fuel, and suddenly, you know, we, we were like, literally on a, like, high on our own fumes, talking about our, our totally, incipient yeah. godhood for, like, a few hundred years, and a lot of people still are in a really annoying way. And, uh-huh. <laughs> and like, somehow missing the point, which is that in, in separating yourself from the rest of the system, in, in, like, declaring that you're so rich that you don't need to worry about the tidal wave that's going to take out everyone who lives further yeah, down yeah. the mountain than you do, because your mansion uh-huh. on top yeah. is going to, you know, will survive anything that you are ignoring all of the externalities created by that system of belief and behavior. You know, that like we're the I, one of the more potent things that ever uh, landed in me in college was a talk on ecosystem services and how if you look, if you try to like calculate the cost of recreating the carbon cycle the oxygen cycle the water cycle that if you look at everything that the earth does to sustain us that is not visible to the human economy first of all Mm -hmm. like we it would cost more than 10 times all the money in the world to technologically recreate those things if we destroyed them and so like the entire Mm -hmm human world is like a film on the surface of the actual value of our world, which is invisible to almost everyone. And so like, 
I've been I've been in this long argument. I'm happy to link you to this. Um, I've been in this long argument on Facebook about how that means that all of the value that we create as human beings is essentially uh, a a a, high, a steep interest bearing loan that that we've taken out against our own future and our own past that we're that we destroy our our cultural legacy we destroy the wisdom mm-hmm. that we've accumulated as as a species that's embodied in our environments that we've created and our traditions you know i mean this is very clear when you look at the way that science eradicated folk medicine and folk religious traditions all around oh, yeah. the world Absolutely. you know i mean this Absolutely, is like whoops yeah. like we're coming back around to this stuff yeah. now being like oh i guess an old yeah. wives tale actually had some basis yeah. in, in in fact yeah. you know um but because we didn't know how to measure these things we didn't know how to subject them to the, our experimental design we considered them crap you know and so mm-hmm. Like here we are uh, in a world where like, this is why, you know, I've, I've painted a lot of dinosaurs at festivals and concerts over the years. And I always include like UFOs in the, in the painting. And it's because <laughs> I, you know, the, the weird re-enters this picture as an existential necessity. You know, like we have to, in the words of, of David Bowie, uh, turn and face the strange in order to, you know, really deal with the complexities of the problems we have created for ourselves in this time. And so the weird thing about the Anthropocene, in my opinion, is that it is, you know, like even calling it that is a little ridiculous because, yeah, maybe to the fossil record, this is like an era defined by concrete and radioactive waste and so on. Yeah. But what is really emerging through our reckoning with what we have done to the world and the system, the situation we've created for ourselves is that it is forcing us to engage with everything that we thought was nonsense or irrelevant or, Mm -hmm. you know, a, a fantasy or, you know, like, like, Religion and magic are making an enormous comeback right now in a time yeah. when our science is more sophisticated than it's ever been. So, yeah, you know, in a weird, you know, like I think of it more as like the weirdo scene, you know, <laughs> because, yeah, yeah. because yeah. yeah, like we live in, we live day in and day out in the, in the built environment. And yet I was just listening to, uh, to uh, Gordon White on my friend Stuart Davis's podcast, Aliens and Artists. And he made a really interesting point, which is that for animists, that the idea that you leave your house and you go out into nature in order to get away from it all is like completely backwards because you're leaving this like sterile, desiccated, rectilinear human environment that we've created. And you're moving out into this like rich biodiverse realm of like all of these beings that are in communication with each other that you're just sort of like, Oh, I'm here alone in the woods. It's like, no, you're not. If a tree yeah. falls in the <laughs> woods not. and it makes no sound and I mean, it, and, and no one's there to hear it. Does it make a sound? Well, there's someone there to hear it. Like it doesn't have to be yeah. a human being. Yeah. It could be another tree. Trees yeah. communicate acoustically, yeah. but you know, like most of us yeah. aren't thinking in that way and that's going to change. Like that is in the process of changing yeah. now. So really the Anthropocene is sort of like e- even calling it that I think is what historian William Irwin Thompson would have called the sunset effect, which is that like right as we move out of one era of history and into another, that era kind of flares up and it's death throes. And it looks mm. like it's getting more and more that way. Like it looks like we're yeah. getting more and more ensconced in this trap that we have created for ourselves out of technology when really what that means is like that's that is the trap that we have created fighting for its own survival before it collapses and so yeah. anyway i don't know that's this is like I'm, i hope i'm not giving anyone a bad trip I th- this could go on and on and on <laughs> forever like it's a dangerous thing i could we could just go I on honor your forever. time here yeah
All right. That about does it for this episode of the Neo Jurassic Podcast, and I really, really hope you've enjoyed it. We're going to go ahead and close out this episode with a special little tune that was written and performed by our guest and friend, Michael Garfield, some years back. Uh, he was working really hard on a polished, finished studio version to share for this episode, but unfortunately it wasn't quite ready in time. So we're going to be sharing this uh, older live recording, and uh, I hope you dig it. But he assures me there is a fancy finished version that's just coming coming your way any day now so if you do enjoy the song check out michael garfield this should be available at some point soon but until then this is michael garfield's life finds a way in the pouring rain from forgotten ages switching given sexes Through electric fences Long extinct but here Smarter than you fear Dodging categories Towering before stories Life breaks free Life expands to new territories, painfully and even dangerously. Uh, life finds a way. Climbing out of mines Into books and films And toys and rides Shaping generations Yours and mine Realer than imagination Fiction true as fact Chicken teeth are bags. Oh, be careful what you wish for. I hope you want to die by dinosaur. Life breaks free. Life expands to new territory. Life